So our first speaker for the day is Dr. Amarna Chatterjee. Dr. Amarna is currently the head of analytical development, biologics department in Sinjin International. He was earlier associated with Gokhar Research Center and Stellis Biopharma as general manager of analytical division. He is a biophysicist and is involved in the generation and analysis of biophysical data under the purview of CMC data on anti-diabetics and allied pharma molecules using an array of spectrometric and spectroscopic methods for both process development as well as regulatory submission. Thank, thank you, Dr. Strategy. I would uh, request sir to take over the first lecture. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Ashwini. Thank you, Dr. Ratnesh, for uh, year on our year organizing such uh, wonderful uh, workshops which actually help all of us in uh, delving deep into the regimes of biologics. Uh, uh, what I will do is I will start off, uh, by, let me just share my screen. I hope all of you are able to see the presentation. Yes, sir. Yeah. I will just put my video off so that the continuity of the lecture goes on. And uh, if uh, if there are any doubts in between, uh, I would request Rashwini to just convey it. I may not be able to see the raised hand and all. So that's why. And uh, as I said, uh, Thanks to uh, this initiative, especially from Ratnesh and his team, uh, uh, that we are able to, you know, understand a lot more better over the last couple of years across the academic as well as the industry with regards to the, the you know, the nitty gritties of biologics, their development and their regulations and eventually their, uh, you know, submission to regulatory authorities. Now, when we talk of uh, biologics, one of the key parameters, not only for biologics, but for entire pharma is the CQA. And what CQA is essentially, uh, I mean, all of us know it is critical quality attribute, but what is so critical about a quality attribute that it needs such a special definition? I hope by the end of this lecture, I will be able to uh, provide you the, the platform which will eventually be built upon by rest of uh, the experts from industry and academia who are, I, I see a very good uh, you know, layout for this entire workshop. And I'm sure by the end of this workshop, you will be really, really up and running with respect to how you define CQAs, how do you characterize these CQAs, and how they are actually one of the most important parameters to understand before you take up any process development. So I will start off by giving a very brief introduction on the CQA. Basically, CQA is basically what is the as defined in the ICHQ to Q8 R2, where it defines it. I will just read it as such that a physical, chemical, biological or a microbiological property or characteristic that needs to be within an appropriate limit range or distribution. So what does that mean? That means basically any quality attribute of a molecule that needs to be defined upfront before even you start off making that molecule. And how do you define it? You basically want to target your product. When, when what we say, what do we mean by target? We mean quality target product profile, you know, the QTPP as they call it. So once the QTPP is defined, to achieve that QTPP, you need to understand what are the critical quality attributes that you will monitor for ensuring that your product is eventually what it is intended to be and it is safe and efficacious. So if you look at CQA, then they, they are of course associated not only with the drug product, you know, the final definition of the drug product, but it is also important all the way 
from the intermediate, you know, the in-process materials, the drug substance that is made, the excipients that are used to generate the drug product, and of course, the, the quality of the drug product, what will define eventually the quality of the drug product. And I, when, when we talk of small molecules, there the CQAs are essentially defined by the purity, the strength, you know, and how you release the drug, how the drug is released, and overall stability. In case of biologics, all these attributes are there. Besides these attributes, you also have to look at the structural implications. And because we are also looking at uh, recombinant biologics, you have to look at the HCPs, HCDNA, and all that are, that are associated with any recombinantly produced product. And all these factors together make up the CQA for a biology. Hence, it becomes a bit, way bit more complicated when you talk of CQAs for biology. This is also evident from this picture, which I think I have shown, in, have shown it n number of times. All of us have seen it in various uh, programs. But this is the crux of it. As you move from a small molecule to a bigger molecule, as the complexity of the structure increases, so does the complexity of understanding the function in context with the structure. And all these eventually lead to your, uh, what you call as the critical quality attributes. Basically, basically, the quality attributes that are critical to define the process, that are critical to eventually define the function of the product. Now, when we talk of therapeutic biologics, of course, you have got the chemical uh, pharmaceuticals, you have got the protein pharmaceuticals, you have got the oral dosage route or the parenteral dosage route, right? Both. When we talk of oral dosage route, at least you have some safety factors taken care by the body itself because you, it has to go through your, uh, uh, your uh, digestive tract. It has to essentially deal with a very strong acid in the stomach. Dr. Chatterjee, sorry yes. to interrupt. So can you sure. please hide that bar on your screen? Stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for that. Uh, uh, I hope you have read the previous ones. So this is what it was. Identifying CQS for biologics becomes complicated. So when, again, when we when we talk of uh, the the biological product. It becomes important because most of the biological products are parenteral doses. Basically, you are injecting it. It is, it is directly available to the bloodstream. And hence, it becomes all the more important that we understand the quality attributes in such a way that the, the attributes which are critical for the stability of the product, attributes which are critical to make the product efficacious, are tuned in such a way that eventually your protein doesn't become immunogenic and it gives a consistent uh, outcome the process gives a consistent outcome this uh, slide kind of shows you that why it becomes so much necessary for us to address it structurally as well as functionally as well as have a very thorough understanding of the HCP and HCDNA that are associated with a recombinant protein. You see, all these that you look at are what play a major role in biology. And because these are associated or these are coming from a living factory, which is the living cells, all these can be modulated by those living cells. And what that modulation is, that modulation is essentially the PTN, the post-translational modification that you talk about. Besides the HCP issue that may come up. In case of mammalian, the viral load also becomes very important. When we say mammalian, uh, mammalian products are essentially the antibodies. Usually, the antibodies are produced using mammalian uh, uh, cells. This uh, slide kind of should give you a, an understanding that when we talk of CQA, what exactly it is? Well, the CQA is any entity that can be determined by analytical methods 
which will tell you about the physical characteristic and which will govern the process conditions in such a way that eventually you have a consistent product which is safe and efficacious that's the whole idea of it that you why it is so important that you understand you characterize you identify cqas well in advance before you jump into the process all the more so because in biologics you do have this heterogeneity in biologics there are long non linear kinetics going going on of course in some of the small molecules there also you may have second or third order kinetics but in biologics you will always have non linear kinetics and that is all the more reason that you we understand whatever attributes are associated with a product should not give me eventually an immunogenic uh, entity with my product and as you as you see here when we talk of uh, biological products there are n number of entities that form biological products of course on top is monoclonal antibodies then you have got recombinant proteins again a very well known recombinant protein is the insulin which is basically a chronic therapy you have of course naturally derived products you have got vaccine products you have got gene therapy products plant derived by pharmaceuticals and so on and so forth i will give a very quick introduction on this part because there are two aspects to it one aspect is the biosimilars where you already have a standard if you do an extensive study of that standard you already know which cqas will eventually affect my product and that, that is the biosimilar standard basically the reference standard but when we talk of novels here it becomes all the more important that we dwell a lot on the stability parameters for any novel that we talk about. sorry and for the consistency of a novel you have we have to approach it step by step in the sense that the first part is that whenever we are targeting a novel product we are looking at a particular disease or already there are n number of products available in the market but we are probably looking at ensuring a different route of administration for the novels for example the the very famous case of oral insulin these are a couple of things where the novels will be uh, are are being basically targeted and and when we talk of novels the cqa determination is very niche i mean the sequent determination is also novel because the cqa determination doesn't have a reference standard as in the case of biosimilar and it is here that all our spectroscopic uh, uh, understanding takes a lot of uh, uh, you know in or rather gives a lot of insights especially the mass spectrometry mass spectroscopy which you will delve upon in this uh, couple of days of the workshop and why mass spectroscopy because from a mass spectroscopy perspective you can actually delve deep into the atomic regime and understand its functionality at an atomic level without actually compromising on labeling a product why 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 i say labeling because whenever you are talking about an nmr or an or an x ray there is a certain amount of uh, you know modification you will need to do to actually generate the the eventual structure of a protein but in mass spec although it is a destructive technique you don't really need a labeling there except again please do not quote me wrong here because in mass spec also there are certain aspects where you will need labeling specifically when you are talking about quantitative mass spec because there again you need isotope labeling with respect to a standard however when we talk of a fast and efficient technique to understand the atomic level nitty gritties or to decipher a ptm for example 
mass spec becomes very, very important. And, and many of the CQAs are, by the way, easy to characterize using mass spec. Now, as I have already mentioned that why CQA has become important? Because on one hand, CQA helps you to understand the process. It helps us to design the process in such a way that it is consistent and it is in control. The whole aspect of CMC, the chemistry manufacture and control is or rather has the basis of its origin in CQA. And from CQA only, you will eventually get your CPPs, which is the critical process parameters. And once you have a controlled process, a consistently controlled process, you will generate a consistently controlled and well understood product. And unless you have a well understood product, you do not, you will not be able to, uh, basically, we will not be able to handle or, or rather keep a tab on its safety and efficacy. Because unless you know that your process is not throwing up immunogenic entities, you cannot say that my product is safe, right? Also, unless I know my process is actually consistently giving the same fold, specifically for biologics, I cannot have the same efficacy batch after that. And hence, CQS become play a very important role as a as kind of a uh, uh, mediator between the process and the eventual clinical implication. And it becomes important for us to physicochemically understand the CQAs. When we say CQAs, we do have the aggregate. The impurity profiles become, and when we say impurity profile, it includes HCP, HC DNA. They also become important uh, parameters. And from a product quality attribute, aggregation, deamidation, any kind of degradation, the product's uh, vulnerability to cleavage, all these become CQAs depending on which of these attributes you will need to control or which one of these attributes become critical for you to control your process. And the functional implication of CQAs that I already mentioned is the safety and efficacy. And the first part, which is physicochemical understanding, is highly uh, a very highly demanding and extensive work that need, that is needed, and it is here that biophysics or structural biology helps a lot. If you look at the regulatory requirements, regulator of course wants that again, with respect to the product quality, safety, and efficacy, the regulator wants that we know our product. We know our product and we know that we are able to consistently de deliver that product. And since CQAs kind of define the process and, and in biologics, you know, it is known that process is the product. Process defines your product. And that gives, again, the, the, the point that why CQA determination, CQA characterization is important. And this is basically accomplished at these multiple levels. But, but when we talk of determination of CQA or its usage per se, it is basically here. It is in this chemistry manufacturing and control only that you will be talking about a CQA or a CPP. Because post this, whatever you get, the implications are seen in these, basically the preclinical and the clinical aspect. And when we talk of novels, as I said, novels, uh, you, you look at process after process after process, process one, process two, process three, and you compare amongst these processes as you go towards each process giving you the novel product, you are moving towards better and better understanding of your novel product. And you eventually know that, okay, these attributes of my novel are critical to have a consistent product which is giving a consistent efficacy data. And eventually you know that, okay, my this process is give, giving me no immunogens and hence this process is what I will follow for a novel 
to give me unsafe and efficacious product in case of biosimilars you know you do have a reference standard but again it's not easy just because you have the reference standard doesn't mean that you know the process parameters and to come up with the process parameters not only we have to extensively study the reference product but also again process of process after process after process you need to understand which quality attributes are critical to give me a consistent product now when we talk of cmc it is essentially uh, you are looking at the physical chemical properties when we say physical chemical properties it is the identity it is the structure and in the presence of a process buffer or in the presence of an excipient how my product is behaving what are the characteristics of my product that i will be looking at and that is all is defined by the physical chemical properties when we look at the functional repertoire it is the biological activity that you will be looking at and of course specifications are inherent to physical chemical properties and you will be looking at or you will be generating specifications which are in a way a modulation or rather the representation of the cqa the specifications kind of represent the cqa and you 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 will have specification for your cqas impurities become important because impurities are directly leveraged with respect to either immunogenicity or any kind of uh, efficacy uh, reduction or redundancies that you may have due to the impurities and stability parameters become important because whenever you are looking at the product's lifetime or the life cycle of the product you are bound by the stability data of that product and as long as we have a, a thorough handle on all these attributes you know that you we have understood our cqs well and the tools that you use i mean this we have seen uh, many times but it is always uh, good to you know keep reminding us how important it is that we should understand the primary sequence how important it is that any modification in the primary sequence when i say modification it can be a ptm in case of biologics we understand that okay this is my ptm and is this ptm detrimental to my product if it is detrimental definitely you have to control it that again becomes a quality attribute which is critical to the product quality and hence it's a cqa same is true for the folding because that is where your disulfide linkages understanding disulfide linkages understanding how my protein fold is consistent across uh, different batches how my protein fold is becoming more and more stabilized in the presence of a, a when when we are doing for example drug product development it becomes important that we know that my excipients are not you know uh, interfering with the fold of the product or rather the tm measurements that we talk of does play a big role in saying that okay you have a nicely folded stable product in so and so excipient so when it interactions and all again become the characteristics of of a protein uh, specifically in case of antibodies glycosylation play, play a very major role in case of antibodies determining the quality of an antibody and again uh, as we as we go further we we can always open up a debate on on how how you will you know consider glycan or the glycan profile of a molecule as a cqa and how are you going to control it you know is it is it a cqa well depends depends on uh, considering the fact that it is what actually defines the function of of an antibody or rather ensures the 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 integrity of an antibody it does become a cqa again heterogeneity of size charge when we look at charge variants controlling charge variants charge variants play again an important role across the biologics regime 
they become CQAs. The aggregation behavior. It is a quality attribute that we need to uh, we need to really really monitor. Why? Because some of the products, the aggregates are actually immunogenic. One example is insulin, the insulin glargine specifically, where any covalently bonded aggregation is immunogenic. Hence, it becomes very very critical to ensure that we monitor and control aggregation through the process and eventually through the stability all impurities which eventually land up in the final protein product needs to be monitored and controlled while i, I all of us would want our products to be free of any impurities but depending on the requisites or rather rather the the demand of that uh, protein you may have some impurities which which you will never be able to resolve from from the pure product and that is where it becomes important that we understand those impurities from a immunogenic perspective again a critical quality of course bioactivity and uh, anything to do with uh, the sterility part the sterility part has its implications on the safety of the product. Bioactivity has its implications on the efficacy of the product. Both of them are monitored. And from a quality attribute, yes, they are there. But from a process per perspective, you will be essentially dealing with the physical chemical parameters. I will just briefly touch these two slides, which kind of tells you about the the you know the the life the life cycle or rather the phases of uh, of your drug product development. And if you look at it, that the moment we talk about the initial pro uh, product characterization, which is basically the preclinical, you should have actually defined your CQAs already, and then you refine your CQAs as you go from. Your, your product development life cycle to eventually hit upon a final product which will go into your phase three. And by this time, you, you would have you know, narrowed down your list of CQAs and you know, basically, I, I should have narrowed down the list of your QAs and you definitely term all of those parameters that remain to be monitored as CQAs to ensure that post phase three, when you are going to commercial, you are, con you are consistently getting the product the desired product with the desired internet use with the desired safety and efficacy in case of biosimilarity of course you only have phase one and phase three but all the more important that when you start off you have defined your cqas or understood your cqas well when we talk of structural insights which which kind of define your CQAs, you need to, we, we basically need to ensure that the first thing that you will be anytime talking about in the case of protein biologics or protein therapeutics is essentially the primary structure how it folds into the secondary structure and eventually falls into a quaternary structure to give you a desired, desired efficacy or desired function. And to decipher that, one of the best methods to do so is mass spectrometry. Well, you have Edman degradation also, but Edman has a, has a limitation that the moment you go beyond 10 amino acids, it becomes difficult to have a signal strong enough to you know map the entire uh, sequence and this becomes more so in case of monoclonal antibodies which when we talk of monoclonal antibodies it is something where we are talking about uh, about a 140 or 150 kd molecule and that is where mass spectrometry plays a very vital role in understanding the or rather having a handle on the entire sequence of the product. 
circular dichroism or fluorescence gives you secondary tertiary uh, aspects. IR spectroscopy also gives you secondary aspects. Capillary electrophoresis helps us in understanding the quality attributes with respect to charge variance in a better way. Of course, you have got ion exchange chromatography also from an HPLC perspective, which gives you a, a thorough understanding of the charge variance. Light scattering is important because that gives a, a sound understanding of the particulate matter that may be present in your product and how they grow or how, how they, they may grow or they may diminish as your product ages. So the stability uh, understanding does require an understanding of the particulate or, or rather the aggregate behavior of a protein. And that is where light scattering plays a very critical role. Of course, you have got SEC, but but from a, from a thorough understanding of uh, the type of aggregates that may be present, light scattering becomes very important. So you have got SEC malls, or you may have field flow fractionation malls, FFF malls, which both give an understanding of the actual aggregates. I mean, you have DLS also, but DLS gives you the hydrodynamic radius. And when we talk of uh, uh, multi-angle scattering, which is this basically static light scattering, you get a thorough understanding of the actual product behavior with respect to the distribution of uh, aggregates or the, the, the volume or the length of aggregates that may be present. And all these play a critical role in understanding the quality attributes and a few of them become critical to the product. In this slide, uh, basically, if you if you look at it, we do have, from a physical chem chemical characterization standpoint, you have got the two kinds of structure, right? The primary structure and then the higher order. Some people may say, okay, you have got primary structure, you have got secondary structure, and then you have got the higher order structure. Given give or take you do need to understand the primary, secondary, tertiary, and the quaternary structure of your, pro of your protein or of a biologic well to decipher its function eventually. In case of glycosylated proteins, of course, glycosylation becomes important. Besides your other parameters, which is basically defining the purity or the PTM of the product. And all these together, all the understanding of all these quality attributes eventually give us what we call as a very thorough insight into the CQA, which you will, which we will eventually uh, control in in order to have our critical process parameters. Just a very very uh, kind of uh, uh, easy example to understand what we talk of structure. These are the insulin, but if you look at insulin, it has its own variants. You have got Lispro, you have got Aspart, you have got Glargine, where essentially changes occur either in the end of B chain or the A chain. And all these actually lead to a difference in the overall behavior of the product. So you, 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 you go from a, native insulin to a basal insulin, which is insulin blood gene, or a fast-acting insulin, which is insulin last part of this. But, and of course, you have got the primary structure where you 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 do protein mass fingerprinting followed by MSMS-based sequencing to ensure that we understand our, our product from a primary structure perspective. Now, how does peptide fragments or peptide mass fingerprinting become useful? I mean, one is, of course, the primary structure. But the other use from a mass spectrometry perspective is to decipher the PTMs. And why it is important? Because when we talk of, say, for example, a glycosylation, it is a PTM. The question is, in which of these fragments is the glycosylation attached? Second aspect where it is helpful is to is, is helpful is to decipher the disulfide linkages. It becomes very easy. For example, if you look at insulin, which is a very, uh, very, very um, easy example, I would say to understand this. 
you have these two right these two uh, peptides which are linked by del sulfide <laughs> and when we when you do a simple glucy digest you are getting these fragments right this one two three four fragments and the moment you do a reduction or a reduction and alkylation this disulfide breaks and at least you know the positions of these dels of course a from insulin insulin is also a complicated molecule in that way because you really don't know how do you decipher between you know this intra chain disulfide versus the inter chain disulfide and that is the reason why only in the case of insulin it becomes important to even look at chemical either you do a chemical uh, disintegration of this molecule or you go to nmo because in nmr based on the noes i will show you on a later uh, slide you can decipher the position of these disulfide link again connecting back to the cqa aspect the moment you have a disulfide scrambling you have a potentially immunogenic product which may control of who which may be important for your product to be safe and that's why such a entity or such a impurity may become your critical quality attribute which we you need to monitor and that's why an understanding of these disulfide linkages also become important same is the true same is uh, true also for oxidations or for methyl uh, you know the methionine uh, residues which which become highly prone to changes and this is just an example of how you do the msms based sequencing basically by ion based uh, sequencing you do what happens there is that either you 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 start cleaving it at the amide linkages and then you start building building back your uh, product by adding these uh, cl uh, clipped species as it clips at the amide linkages and you you make use of by ions to decipher your entire sequence while the secondary structure is an important entity from a characterization perspective this tool where you talk of cd this becomes more important for products which are purely helical or purely beta sheet but if there is an ensemble mix you know mix of beta sheet and uh, helical content it becomes important that we decipher that to ensure that your product is consistently giving the or other your process is consistently giving a product with a similar kind of ensemble uh, ensemble uh, ratio for for your secondary structure content and whichever attribute can tweak that ratio becomes critical to the product and hence becomes a cqa when we look at again coming back to the uh, insulin example because of this interchain and intrachain uh, uh, you know the confusion the which which may not be sorted out only by mass spec uh, i mean protein mass fingerprinting you do have nmr as a very useful tool here although nmrs uh, only i should say only uh, the, the issue is that the moment you go beyond 10 kilo dalton product or rather maybe these days considering the high field maybe after 15 kd it becomes difficult to decipher unless you do a isotope labeling of the product having said that it still is one of the most powerful techniques to look at solution structure how the protein is natively uh, const constructed in solution and that comes out from nmr this is a very this is one of the first you know experiments for uh, an insulin molecule and since nozies 
the, when I say nosy, it is nuclear over as a effect. Since nosy gives you an understanding of the structural fold, because you know this is the uh, magnetization transfer through space. And the moment you have a disulfide linkage, you get an extra peak because the sulfide linkage brings two molecules a wee bit more closer than they would have been in the spatial orientation. You get one more peak and that helps decipher the linkage as well. And by the way, for those of you who, who understand NMR, you know that these are the cross these are the cross peaks and these are the diagonal peaks and the diagonal peaks are representative of the amino acid sequence and the cross peaks are representative of the closeness of for example this amino acid to this amino acid and it is the intensity of this uh, cross peak in nosy which determines how far or how close two amino acids or rather two atoms are to each other and that is the whole crux of uh, structural determination from NMR. <laughs> now, coming to another important aspect, especially with respect to CQA, is the HMWP, which is basically something which is triggering the aggregate. And when we say when we say aggregate, you know, it, it's a it's a very very dynamic world when we talk of protein aggregates, because these aggregations may be very uniform, or these aggregations may be non-uniform. And when we talk of uh, particulate matter or rather particulate uh, analysis, especially especially one of your release parameters is of course the particulate analysis. Understanding these aggregates or their seeds become all the more important because the moment you understand the seed, you know I have hit upon my CQA, which needs to be controlled in order to give me a, a proper consistent process or, or a proper consistent product, a stable product. And hence it becomes important that we understand the HMWPs really well. And if you look at this data, this is of course again an AUC data for uh, for uh, an, an insulin molecule. But from the perspective of any biologic, it becomes important that we understand these aggregates, or rather these higher order structures, using either SECMOLs or AUC. It's it's and or it's it's good to actually have all these data, the SECMOLS data, the AUC data, and so on and so forth. But it is all very important that these seeds or, or their origin are well understood so that the process can be targeted to control these seeds. This is just one example of of uh, of uh, bio uh, you know how biophysics helped sort out a, 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 a perfect formulation for an igg molecule we started off with ensuring that the secondary structure is stabilized in an excipient and if you look at it this is what is required and when when it when we started off this is where we are where we were in fact, they, those excipients actually helped stabilize the protein to its native state. And this is where, this is kind of, you know, the, the ensemble screen. Once you have the ensemble screen done well, where you know that both my secondary structure and tertiary structure by CD is fine, you can go to the next level, which is MS. HDXML to know that my individual folds, you know, uh, uh, the overall fold of the protein is intact as we go along in this uh, excipient screen. Of course, I'm showing you only three kind of experiments, but here a lot of emphasis was also given on the dynamic light scattering data. A lot of emphasis was also given on the 
melting temperature data, which are again important parameters to ensure that your protein folds are perfect from a TM perspective and they do not lead into any seeding of aggregates or change in the overall structure of the protein when we talk of the hydrodynamic radius by DLS. And the CQA in this case was essentially two. One was a deamidation and one was an aggregation. So both had to be monitored and controlled well. This is another uh, uh, example where mass spec was actually supportive because that told you that, see, this is what it is. This is one of the impurities which gives, uh, you know, the mass spec, of course, since it is uh, something which is already visible in uh, HPLC, you do see it even in the mass uh, regime. This is cleared off when in, in another process. However, there seems to be still some residuals left. Mass spec does show that there are some still residuals left, but are they artifactual or not? Well, you, one can spike it and see, and it, it in this particular case, it turned out that yes, they were still present at a very, very low uh, uh, amount, and which were eventually not immunogenic. And hence, this passed the test of regulatory scrutiny. Now, this is an interesting scenario because when we talk of antibodies, glycans play a very important role. I have termed it as a special CQA because this is more so from a glycosylated protein perspective. And we all know that the functional repertoire of an antibody is eventually modulated by the by its glycosylation profile or rather the glycan profile and that is the reason why all the way from upstream it becomes important to monitor glycans as a critical quality attribute to ensure that the glycans are at a level which are consistent across process. And when we talk of biosimilar, which are consistent and in range of the reference product. If you look at the glycan core structure, you have got either the galacto, uh, basically the galactose, mannose, fucose, xylose, all these coming in combinations to give you your desired glycan profile. And it can be glycan, it can be a silosylation, it can be a fucosylation. Then you also have the sialic acids, and all these actually make up the functional repertoire of an antibody or help. I should not say make up the functional repertoire, but at least help, you know, this, de define the functional repertoire of the antibody. When we talk of, uh, again, glycomolecules, these are a few uh, lines that you can take some time to read through. But ba the, the basic crux of it is that the antibodies must have glycans in the defined orientation, in the defined ratio to, to give its efficacy. And if it is not, maybe your antibody is no longer safe. And that's why it becomes important to treat these glycans also as a CQA, specifically in the case of antibodies or glycosylated proteins. And if you look at uh, the, the, the most important glycoforms expressed in CHO, these are essentially the so-called the, the G0Fs, the G1Fs, and the G2Fs. And all these actually define or rather have an effect on the functional efficacy of the product, which is glycosylated. An example I have quoted here, which is uh, basically uh, a lack of core fucose can lead to a molecule which has an enhanced ADCC. And vice versa, if you have, for example, terminal galactose or a bisecting residues, it only has a subtle effect on the ADC. 
not the receptor binding so it be, so as i i hope you are able to uh, appreciate the importance of understanding and defining cqas all the way from the structural cqas the ptm based sequence uh, cqas or the glycosylation based cqas if you look at the glycosylation uh, uh, characterization techniques you have got again mass spec as one of the major um, tools decipher the exact characteristics of a glycoprotein and what is the implication of understanding and doing or or rather characterizing cqas or ensuring that our our cqas are in place it is of course the functional aspect if you look at this <laughs> again it's a biosimilar because the cqas are well understood because the product or process parameters were well modulated keeping in mind what cqas we are targeting one could get the functional uh, repertoire matching with the innovator product in case of novels you will have something like process batch 1 process 1 batch 1 process 1 batch 2 or maybe process 5 batch 1 process 5 batch 2 and if process 1 and process 2 batch 2 uh, process 1 and process 2 batches are matching you know you have a consistent process in conclusion whenever you are talking about a drug its safety efficacy its regulation all authorities are actually looking for enough ample evidences where specifically in the biologics i have an understanding of the process in light of my cqa the regulatory authority will appreciate more and more if your process consistency are shown by showing a very robust control on your cqa as long as each of the unit operation of the process that you are talking about we have understood which cqa we are targeting which cqa is eventually not seeded which cqa does not come out all the way to the uh, final product or which cqa does come out to the final product but we know thoroughly what is its structural implication a uh, structural and functional implication regulatory authorities are fine of course as i hope uh, in in my in my talk today you were able to appreciate how biophysics and biochemistry helps in ensuring that you know the cqas are well understood for the process to be in control and to be consistent is the same uh, thing that as long as all the analytical tools are used well and to extensively characterize the cqa you know that you have a have very good handle on the product's quality and eventually safety and of course biologics assessment and production are kind of regulated by the cqas because if you look at the cqas they are something which need to be tuned understood and controlled to ensure you have a consistent product which will eventually give a consistent clinical implication thank you so much for your attention and we can discuss it further thank you dr chatri ji so we have one question in the chat box i'll read out read it out to you sure yeah how could we differentiate between the alpha and the beta glycosidic bonds in glucose how can you differentiate between the alpha and the beta glycosidic bonds in glucose okay okay that's a that's a very basic question so one, one of the ways to do it is of course uh, 
uh, you can do it through maldi ms and the best way to do it will be ideally nmr because th that is where you can you, you know which one is alpha which one is beta based on the cross peak that you look at from a glycos uh, from a glucose perspective so you have to either go for maldi ms based uh, isd uh, or you have to go for nmr analysis thank you so much yeah yeah thank you sir for such an informative talk please accept our sincere gratitude and we truly appreciate your consideration and your time thank you thank you sir